This is a conversation between myself and Guy Smith, former radical non-dual communicator, reflecting on a debate between Richard Sylvester, who shares a message on the radical end of the spectrum of self-negating non-duality, and spiritual philosopher Tim Freak, who now shares a humanistic unity paradigm he calls univigilism. Guy and I are shedding light from personal experience on toxic dynamics within derealizing forms of non-dual teachings, that despite a certain kind of relief that this can sometimes offer people, which it did for both Guy and I at one point, the grim and severely damaging effects that these perceptual shifts often have on people. I was like, yeah, very much in, in that scene, it was back in the early 2000s, so it's quite quite a while back, but... No, I was one of the one of the spokespersons. I wrote a book and was very accepted within the scene. But yeah, after thankfully not too long, I'd say a year or two, I, it was starting to get very clear to me both from the kind of dynamics I was seeing externally, yeah. and also how things felt internally that there was something really not good there. And I got to this crossroads and. Um, thankfully went into being a body living in the world in an embodied um, real way. But it's crazy because it's, we'll obviously get more into the detail of it, but that it's branded as, and people within it believe it as something wonderfully good for you. And yet I've seen countless people now who are completely lost and in a really grim place. Yeah. And so it's important that people know know that because there are some people who were writing to me when I was again a spokesperson of it who were in really grim places. So it's important people hear another side of the story. Um yeah. yeah. Maybe this would be helpful before we go further to maybe share like some of the beliefs or teachings in, in radical non-duality, just so that when we're talking about the damaging effects, what are our core messages? Mm. Everything's just a dream, yeah. just a story. There's no self, just an illusion. The world is just a, an appearance, a dream. That's a dream world. But sometimes it's called, it's, it's branded as love because there is something strangely freeing about losing any sense of self or responsibility, like a whole lot of like shame and can go away with that. But there's no you even. It's very, it can get very hollow. But it can feel very blissful to start with, which is like, oh, this is amazing. I have the complexity of relationships out the window, mm -hmm. any kind of like discomfort in my body or kind of like emotional, that that's done away with. Yeah. So it can feel lovely and exciting and powerful, but it's... A lot of people that grab the rabbit hole, we're profoundly dehumanized and... Familiar, but it's... It's, it's sounds... grim. It's very dark and very grim. And it's you and I... Was it like a toy? often find people and I definitely did this myself it's almost like you you prescribe you try to prescribe yourself even more non-duality as a solution to the grimness that's actually come from non-duality so you it gets I must just come back to this I don't know, so no self and then I'll feel all fresh and point of this conversation was to do a very kind of like thoughtful reflection on an interview that you and I both watched between Richard Sylvester, who's a radical non-duality messenger. And Tim Freak. So for me, it's such an important interview, maybe not for the reasons that other people would see, but Tim had been a, a non-dual kind of philosopher and he was never radical non -dual. always like very pro the individual, even when he saw the individual as sort of like an illusory character. He was more so aligned with the kind of true self and false self and the dream world and the dream character, everything's within who you are, et cetera. But he yeah. had a major turning point when he started to doubt all of that, now has this whole virtual philosophy where the individual is 100% real, nothing is an illusion, and really it's about significance of the individual. So... The thing that's changed for me, what is notable looking back, is that it came with an interpretation which I had got from Gadata and then from the other non-dual teachers I was exploring with. 
And what's happened to me over the last 10 years is that I've come to the, a lot of ideas have, have turned around. So now when I look at the experience, I still see it as interesting, but I don't see it. I don't understand it in the way that I did. Well, Tim and Richard have this conversation. Yeah. And just one, wanted to mention Richard is that was the author of the book you mentioned earlier, wasn't yes, it? I, but yeah, so yeah, just okay. telling that. So, okay, yeah. so let's go back to that. So Richard Sylvester is the author of this book, I Hope You Die Soon. This conversation and what I found from it was that in a lot of the interactions and a lot of the ways that Richard acted and responded were just like these really great examples of some of the the effects that it has on people to on those ideas and implement them into having this sort of illusion of your sense of self and reflective thought. It really highlighted some of the main like dark, like dark spots, if you will, dark sides that we both want to bring to the light. And then it can be really helpful to reflect on this and to share with people completely mm -hmm. just from the hopes that people can better understand some of the inherent danger yeah. in this. I want to sort of add that I, I think one of the cool things about that discussion was that it very it's very rare in my experience that the non-dualists at that end of the spectrum that Richard is on and I, and I used to be on, it was very rare that they subject themselves to any kind of kind of scrutiny. Right. Usually the, the setting is an interviewer who is already on board or easily persuadable or it's people who've paid to be there to listen to them. So they're already have bought into it on some level. And and the whole sort of premise is that, that they're speaking absolute truth, or at least they, they're in touch with the absolute knowing, even if they can, you know, it's impossible to find the right words they are, and the audience is in ignorance. So there's this massive duality of power and of knowledge and wisdom. It was great. Kudos to Richard for doing that. Yeah. Um, because, and well, kudos to both of them for doing it because it, it just allows for dialogue, which, and it's usually just monologue. People will ask questions, but they're either shot down or, or as long as they're like right in tune with what the person's saying, maybe they'll be accepted. But there's no dialogue. Um, so it was quite a rare thing to see that in action. So I'm glad they did it. And as you say, that gives us a chance to. Again, continue this creating dialogues rather than monologues with our own, bringing in our own sides. Just to say, I, I don't, I've never met Tim. I'm not associated with him. I like the fact that he brings kind of humanity, empathy, responsibility and stuff into the picture. It's very much, uh, to me, it seems the core of anything that, that, that deserves the name spiritual, if you want to use the word spiritual. So I think it's really important then he was putting that to Richard and as you say, it made for a kind of interesting spectacle in a way, just seeing how they, these two very different perspectives challenging each other, particularly Tim challenging Richard. And yeah, hopefully we can elaborate and extend that, that conversation. Yeah, yeah. And definitely we're not, neither of us are saying like that we're here to advertise Tim's philosophy or that's you know our new no thing. I think I see things differently than him in, in in certain areas but it's it's very refreshing to find the humanity and stuff is there like I very much agree with that and I will come to that at some point massively resonated with his shock at, at the the way that Richard was responding yeah. to the question with responsibility yeah. and morality has your sense of morality if you had any shifted after non-dual scene. I mean, I didn't murder people on the streets before I came across non-duality, and I don't murder people on the streets now. It also reminds me of something I don't quote very often. I heard Moody quoted as having said said this, that somebody said to him, is it okay if I go and kill, you know, kill somebody on the streets? And he said, well, you know, because it's, this is a dream, does it, you know, is that okay? And he said, well, yeah, it's fine if you don't mind being hunted down by the dream police and put in a dream prison and tried and, you know, put back in a dream prison. So there's a sort of kind of... Wow. Strange, That's a horrible mis answer. Strange, strange. Mis Hang on. That is a... absolutely horrible. But what was interesting is is that you you focused on the consequence for the perpetrator as that being the moral question. 
that's why it felt like really ugly thing, really ugly idea. When I was in non-duality, I mean, I would have agreed and almost relished it, I think, his response. I there's like a few different like major themes that I had picked up on that because for me, like I've spent the last five years, like really trying to understand like what the dark side of the non-dual spirituality teachings and like teaching scene are like, what are the dark, dangerous aspects of it? Why are they that way? Um, like how common is it? How does it affect people? And then how do you help them? So some of the things that I picked up on were a lot of those like main elements of it that are dangerous and are so dark. And that includes, we talked about this and maybe this is where we could start is with morality and how, you know, one of the questions I think that was asked was how has your sense of morality been affected by your, I don't know if it was since your loss of self or whatever. I think the, the handy thing, like for me or from me in a way, is that I it's quite, very easy for me to put myself in Richard's shoes because that, that was the space I occupied. The, like him, I went to Tony Parsons meetings. Actually, I went to a, only went to a couple, but you know, read his books, went to some other spin-off kind of teachers, and that's where, I, where the space that I occupied. And the subtitle to that book, this is not an endorsement because I don't recommend for your health to read the book, was Irresponsible Irresponsible Writings on Non-Duality. Uh, it wasn't my choice of subtitle, but it, it, it was, I didn't object to it because it was true. So there was no question there was, uh, uh, that there is a, if you say that there's no self and there's no choice, then responsibility clearly goes there. The, the, the non-dual communicators pivot a lot. If somebody says, well, that's right, they say, responsibility can arise but that's just putting away like in the question it's not a, a proper like engagement with the question they do that all the time on <laughs> dual, dual communicators so it's important that people can spot that because i think i can talk from within it uh, what richard was talking about that what he found one of the things he found so refreshing and freeing about tony parsons meetings was that tony was would would talk like in a non-moralistic way is how he put it again i think that's a pivot there's no morality i think tim was like on that as well i've got i don't need to worry about anybody else i don't need to worry what anybody thinks there's no self-consciousness because there's no self i don't need to relate that relationships impossible because there's just oneness how can you have a relationship unless you have two entities with some distance between yeah. so you can get a view on them and they get a view on you and you get a sense of yourself and a sense of their self that's the basis of empathy so there would there is a kind of freedom to that but it's like freedom to be a jerk you know it's like freedom to do whatever the hell you like and this is the part of the thing that i was seeing when i would watch footage of other people's meetings that were starting to disturb me like people behaving in such a kind of because there was talk about, oh, it's freedom from being a character. So you can just be anything. But then what people I can do anything. I can say anything. I can be as provocative as I like. Yeah. Look how it, it, it lands with other people because they don't really exist. And actually, they need that. It's almost then turned it not only into a neutral thing, but into a good thing. This is true compassion is being as brutal as possible. And if somebody comes to a meeting and says... I'm really struggling and, and I've just broken up with somebody or somebody's died just to respond to that's just what happens or, or maybe a little show of kind of kindness just so that everybody doesn't <laughs> attack you but really say yes it's all love or it, it's and if you're cast as in ignorance which is the phrasing it was often called ignorance versus knowing or seeing or awake or asleep you know nothing however the person behaves there's got to be an, an intelligence and a justification behind it because it's coming from love it's coming from oneness but that just gives people carte blanche to be right be brutal there's some brilliant descriptions i've read out there of people going to meetings and being like completely like feeling <laughs> punched in the face and like completely and again, that would be recast by a non-dual communicator. Oh, that's a good thing because there's undermining of self. 
exactly. but it's undermining of any kind of balance any kind of and it's completely contemptuous as you yes use that word but you alluded to that there's a real like you're nothing so i can treat you like nothing and i'm not doing it there's again this yeah. total sort of abrogation what's the word abrogation of responsibility something of responsibility lack of accountability and yeah i just i just had a small like moment of aha because you were talking about passion is to i don't know the death of the self or whether it's like helping somebody else destroy their sense of self is true compassion Mm. but if you think of Mm. richard's book title i hope you die soon that Mm. kind of aurelian inversion of I hope you die soon tied to this whole ideology is that that's a good thing. That's freeing you. I hope you get free soon. But like you were saying, there's that morbid kind of dark nihilistic humor that's so common in radical non-duality that I know I was really into as well. Cause I'm yeah, so- it feels like a bit edgy and Oh yeah, we can say anything and we can like, uh, and you know then it can be justified as well we're not we're saying that's a good thing that's right in, right in the job, you wouldn't talk about the end of suffering but you'd talk about that's just then that's reality and that that's you're kind yeah. of that's yeah really but as we know it's more real than i think communicators who are still immersed in the scene are... no we know people who've lost the will to live and some people who've taken their lives, some people who really don't want to be alive, some people are highly ambivalent about it. And it's because of that, I think people also like to say, oh, maybe it's just an underlying mental health issue. And again, that just protects the kind of purity and the pristine kind of untouchability of non-dual kind of dogma. That's so important because I've thought to myself about the title of this book I hope you die soon and after realizing how many people become suicidal and even take mm. them take their lives when they fall down this we call like the non-dual rabbit hole like mm. nihilism and all that that there are many people who either want to literally die or do kill themselves and so to me it's it, it's a lot darker than even those authors realize like the irony of it is that that actually is coming true and not and in a literal way as well. And we both know that we're not being, we're not being like hyperbolic about this. Like this is a oh, really big even close, uh, problem for a lot of people. Being an understatement of thinking, oh, that will sound absurd to a viewer. How can it be? It's just talking about stuff. Nothing bad's going on. It's not like some of the real dark cults that you see where there's real, really it's hard obviously overtly grim stuff going on, but we know our minds are, are neuroscientifically connected to our nervous system, to our body. So ideas really can, and people know this. We say so; it, it really can take you, and it it seems to almost like recode people's people. thinking, so that people can almost get really trapped in a sort of this prison where every any time there's like a hint of their own kind of sense, something kicks and goes. No, that's. And it's, yeah, it's really scary. They get so isolated and and they don't want it anymore. But it's, you know, we have this kind of, um, sort of inner critic that, yeah. that all of us have. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. Agree, but that gets really boosted by non-duality. It does, and yeah. I, I'd argue that radical non-duality is the voice of that. It's the spirituality of this super ego or whatever you want to call it. It's just scythes down any sense of life or feeling or yeah. um, and it makes related. sense yeah uh, i must say a, a thought i had the other day is it, it really strikes me that I, I appreciate there are people close to our age who speak this but it i look at a and it's not to scapegoat a particular generation as obviously any generalization is is a stereotyping and it, it's not fair to put that on on everybody but there is a certain kind of i think character structure of that kind of generation, Richard, sort of Tony Parsons and people of that, where there's a, a thinking of relatives in my family as well, where there's a sort of, one of my relatives, I, I know he really doesn't like psychology. And to me, I think it's because it it would make him have to like, it's 
a bit wounds his pride or something that that there might be aspects of himself that he's not aware of and that he has to consider oh maybe i my behavior there is problematic in some way or at least something that's open to interpretation yeah um, i i'm just already perfect as i am nothing should be in question here and i, I really see that as sort of non-duality is fitting into that of like, don't look at me in any level like just yeah there's no well, self here there's nothing to see here it's, it's i'm immune from all of that yeah as you say immune from self-reflection it may be because I feel like there's been like an explosion of conversations around like the problem of the lack of accountability and responsibility among okay. people end up really harmed and damaged by it. Like a greater understanding of what the role of the guide or teacher or messenger is in their accountability for their teaching context. And of course, it's being taught in this like indiscriminate public way. Here, Richard, and it's been a while since I followed teachers that talk like this, but this whole idea that there's no one communicating the message, like the message is messaging itself, the teaching is speaking itself, whatever it is, that my main, why I get so upset by it immediately is because it immediately absolves them of any responsibility, like preemptively for anything that could result later and from anything that they said to somebody let's say somebody who is suicidal and says, I want to kill myself. And they say, just put a proverbial bullet to your head and realize that you don't exist anyway and die, metaphorically speaking, and then they go home and kill themselves. So your perspective and your experience of people repeating this thing of there's no one here communicating it. And Richard was also yeah. trying to say that I don't have any desire to help. There's no one here who wants to help anybody with this message. I don't see the communication of non-duality as a way to help people. You know, I might help an old lady across the road, but I don't give talks on non-duality to okay. help people. No, I... I mean, it's not that I'm hard and callous and cruel. I mean, maybe I am, but I mean, it's not because of that. You seemed genuinely surprised that I didn't say that it's because I wanted to help people. I mean, why I do it, in a way, personal motivation is irrelevant to me. I mean, it's just something that happens but if I went into personal motivation I just sum it up as saying well it's kind of fun on a wet Saturday afternoon it's you know more interesting than watching football. From your perspective I don't see it necessarily as like a conscious ploy of people be I think it's a result of their eroding their sense of self and like self-reflection but then where, what, yeah, what can you say about this whole, there's nobody here speaking this, therefore it doesn't matter what happens. Like I'm not responsible kind of thing. Yeah, it's just, a, it is a brilliant way, as you say, to kind of absolve responsibility. It just takes that out of the question. You're just, there's no one here. This is just arising. It's just happening. And as you say, like that, then you can just use that if, it's a all size fits all kind of disclaimer. You're completely untouchable. And that's highly problematic, as you say. Is it really just arising that you're creating a website and kind of writing all these books and getting people hooked and taking their money in all kinds of different ways? That's not to say it's a bad thing, like in a sort of world that has market forces, you have to make money if you want to buy stuff. So it's it's not, I'm not trying I'm to make it a point that. here. That's another discussion. But to say that, oh, it's just happening and, it's not, and, um, and there's no motivation here. It's just a level of unself-awareness that is in keeping with what they're saying, but it's it's frightening. And to, to not recognize the kind of, the other kind of, sort of benefits, the kind of ego swelling nature of having an audience who are, who agree with this, that somehow you embody this heavenly, divine transformation thing that they so badly need and desire. And I also think that the, the part of that is, I've heard people who coming to non-duality who have previously been in more kind of typical, I'm talking non-duality here, 
westernized non-duality whatever we're calling it radical neo fighter who've been a bit more traditional kind of indian style sort of guru seeker where all of that's very overt and it's, you're considered like you should be in this kind of relationship that's this kind of divine relationship and the relationship's important the guru's important and non-duality presents itself as doing away with all of that yeah but i think that's just a smoke screen because people do get really hooked and when people get hooked it's typically on some sort of relationship so if you've got this person here at the front and the way they will talk about communicators too is exactly like a guru and so to imagine that they're also not getting some sort of like getting off on this in some way that's a, maybe a bit of a harsh way to put it but just turning up and hanging on your words and asking and wanting to be maybe closer to you or dying to make eye contact with you a lot of the more traditional meetings again this is not near advisor that you make eye contact with everybody before it starts yeah. um but there's still there is still that and there's a real swagger about the kind of non-dual communicator often like the yeah i was just saying okay. that that sort of lack of accountability allows for this yeah i can't exactly remember how i works my way there but it's i, I kind of really see that in a kind of like a kind of swagger of like untouchability no self and I was really thinking, say that again. No self swagger. No self swagger. Yeah, that's a good term. We should coin that. And uh, yeah, and, and I can already hear the sort of response could be what's wrong with the swagger? Swaggering is just arising. But that, that I think just shows the whole point of that. That's the kind of almost like this destruction of meaning. Like you can't, you're not allowed to make meaning of it. You can't. Meaning yeah. is not allowed. And you could see that really in the interview between Tim and Richard. That Tim was like, actually, everything is open to interpretation. And for Richard, it was like, no, it just is. Right. And uh, again, that, that's the way that this kind of getting yourself into unaccountable territory is done is by saying, it's just arising. Swaggering is just arising. Abuse just arises. But it's also love. So all different ways you can pivot to. Yep. And it's scary. And I, we've made this point before, but it's, I think people who occupy that space don't see the problem. Don't see these things. It's not that they're like cunning Bond villains scheming behind the scenes to mess people up. I think they really think that they're doing a good thing and they're not aware of it, but they're not. And in a sense, that's even scarier because it's, if you're completely unaware that you're behaving in a certain way or, or saying certain things that can be so detrimental. Absolutely. It's just an example of when um, perpetuating that whole, I'm not the one giving the message, the message is messaging itself kind of thing, that there was a <clears throat> like a radical non-dual event that took place online. And I was reading through some of the transcripts for one of the guys, Somebody asked as a response to his talk, something like, would this message be, do you think this message would be appropriate for somebody who is super like traumatized from, you might've said from like sexual abuse or rape or something, for somebody who's experienced great trauma, who's really actually needing more uh, like emotional men. And he said that something along the lines, I'm not answering it, but said, the difference between this communication and other communications is that no one's communicating this message. It's just arising. And this message or this communication will only arise for somebody if they're open to it. It's, even if you it's don't it's intend... on you, it's never on this perfect message. Yeah. That have to be. Yeah. Right. But if you're not able to just say as an adult, I don't know, or yeah. hmm, maybe that's something... Yeah. To talk to yeah his you know like to not even be able to have, like the human adult maturity to do that because you're so lost in this dissociate dissociated from the human or the actor or the behavior yeah it's yeah it's sad it's sad it's sad all around obviously my kind of care and sympathy mostly goes to the the, the traumatized person and a lot of my criticism goes towards the person who's acting 
as yeah. though that this is, this is the paradox of it. It's, a, it's presented as just, this is just happening. And the word just gives you a feeling of almost like, oh, it's, in, it's nothing big that's happening and it's just happening on its own. But the implication is this is the word of pure divinity. This, it's not a human saying. This is one that's speaking. It is being so that comes with a riddle of cloud that is the opposite of democracy, and humility, relationship. Yeah. I just think it's you looking at some of the examples that gotten from people who were in like really dark psychological places while working with a non dual teacher. For example, Felt like they were having like a psychotic break and wanted to kill themselves and they would do uh this is more than one person like one was did like a one-on-one -on -one with one of these i don't know non-jurors and were told you this is the who's the one kind of like the who thing of like, who's the one that they need to go to the hospital and just to double down on negating yeah. the self and it? Yeah. but if that person goes through with killing themselves, the, there's no accountability there for, there should be, but then to be able to be like, I didn't communicate it because there's no I, it's just like such a tragic cop-out. It's so tragic and it's just so scary and annihilating on so many yeah. levels. And it, it, it almost produces the thing that it talks about was talking about being no one and nothing yeah and people end up being and nothing if they do take their own life it's scarily performative or scarily i'm not sure like worded crystallite it crystallizes the thing it's talking about but in the darkest possible part. way it's meant to just be a dark joke but it's a dark reality as a well dark reality I think like one of the parts in the interview that maybe stood out most and that definitely rattled Tim was actually when he was talking, when Richard was talking about there being no one here, he himself gave this example and he's like, people will say to that, so then you could just go out and kill someone. And then he quoted Muji, who said something like the, to the question of, okay, if there's no one here, can I just go murder people? And he said, if you murder someone in the dream world, you're still going to have to go to dream prison. And just automatically was that like, oh, like the, it wasn't, yeah. you don't kill people because it causes suffering and hurts people. It oddly from this selfless voice was like such a self-centered, just literally speaking, yeah. self-centered yeah reasoning for why you shouldn't harm others again like tim was saying that oh my god like that's so dark like you're only caring about the perpetrator of the this yeah. crime and that contrast too to hearing him also talk about how this outpouring of love that's always there and it reminds me one of the realizations that i had like when i started to really step away from Realizing that a lot of this love that's talked about, this it's impersonal, it's universal love, where you see everyone as yourself, that love is talked about so much, but I can't remember very many instances of there being talk of loving action and the importance of being kind to people and because it's a valueless ideology. Um, but in some of the non-dual teachers that I had listened to, like Rupert Spira, for example, will say to this question of morality, well, like, once you're self-realized, then moral guidelines need not apply. Even if you've seen through, like, moral guidelines as a construct, once you see everyone else as yourself, you could never harm them, which is this whole, for me, that I see as like this fantasy that when somebody has this no self awakening and is capital self realized that they're automatically going to be virtuous. And we see that's a hundred percent evidence does not show that to be the case. Well, I think the opposite is the case because I think it is. You know, I think it's only when you see somebody as had separates that you can actually see them and listen to them and uh, relate to them. Exactly. If you're, if they're already 
there's no distance between them and you, that you, they are you, then as you say, you, you actually see this very self-censored behavior going on completely out of the, the person's awareness. Is and the love presumably is like a narcissistic love. Then is that kind of just like, I am everything? It's like almost as a megalomaniac would be another way to put it. As this kind of sense of yeah, there's thing a is me, but not the, not the other me. So I can do what I like. Of course, that I, so I do what I like, but it's not said out loud. But it you can see it in the conduct very often, right? Um, without an awareness that they're doing it. It's, uh, this is just happening. And it's free and it's just flowing and it's just spontaneous yeah. rising and if someone else gets hurt that's on them there's that it's just hurt arising and it's their self there's no when, when you said it's uh, uh what's the word a narcissistic kind of love that like what really struck me at one point was like that it, impersonal experience of love that's being had is like it's very much a personal impersonal love experience because it's like when non-dual teachings are presented as you're going to be able to tap into unconditional love like 24 7 it's almost like it's not hedonistic but it's like it's a way that we get to feel good because we get to feel this major love but it's not necessarily one that when you look at the rest of the beliefs or shifts that it's all a dream and there's no one there. It's all just image in your consciousness. So it becomes this like personal experience of impersonal loves. And I found that really ironic. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Oh, the other thing about, no, sorry, go ahead. No, I don't, I'm just thinking about it. I don't have a, yeah. You don't think the ads. I just thought I, it was like, it was telling and unsettling that what, Richard used to talk about this question of morality was Muji, who is a beyond the shadow of a doubt at this point, a cult leader who's exploited his followers. He's giving yeah. an example of somebody who's acts yeah. in harmful, immoral ways as a, her, like a role model. Yeah. That obliviousness is very familiar in terms of seeing. Uh, yeah, I've definitely seen that in other places as well as people just referred to. And so there's nothing to see here. Just easily he said, and it just to me, I don't know a lot about him. I've never sort of, I think he's, or I became aware of him actually when I was leaving, exiting, but I did see there was an expose on him at some point. And just, I think because his you call them ashram sangha his ashram. thing has a bit more of that traditional feeling right he wears the robes and there's very music and it took me into that kind of space that i mentioned he inhabits which is but it's, it's entirely in keeping with the this more kind of in some ways british eventuality <laughs> with mm. tony and so on which is is everything is love everything is love but if everything is love, then everything's reduced to this kind of glow of love. So if somebody's massively suffering over there and you're just seeing love, that like empathy's out the window. So, so any kind of like, it's a scary love where it's like that kind of, this, like in a horror movie where you've got somebody smiling and something awful is going on. Wow. And I think you can have this lovely feeling of, oh, and then you hear about the brutality in the background and it it's always makes for like a very creepy documentary, doesn't it? Like an yeah. expose or something because Yeah. The messaging is love, oneness, intimacy, freedom. You realize one person sitting at the middle of all of this attention and everything and feeling that while the other people are like crushed inside. Hey. Then if brought to light, then it's that's your thing. It's, it, it's, it can't possibly be an effect of love. That's um, a good point. It makes me realize just one way of saying it is that like how this kind of, like how is it that such amazing love leads to such great apathy? You're literally saying out loud, it's just a dream. It's not really happening. And 
people who get involved in like social causes are trapped in the the dream story and all yeah. that. So you realize at a certain point that like you're feeling love, but you're condemning everyone else to yeah. this illusory kind of thing so that you have no desire to step in or speak up for anyone or because it's not really happening. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. It's very twisted. I don't know much would say about that, but you could have a, like a, a really kind of love feeling, but that can have absolutely nothing to do with care or sensitivity or kind of openness or receptivity. They can be two totally different things, which is why the concept of narcissistic love is good because I just don't disturb my love by coming and telling me that actually you feel exactly. crushed by me lapping up the music and the attention. Yeah. And you're actually sitting there feeling like you don't exist. Like you're saying, you don't exist, you're nothing, but you're love. But to be love is not to be love or it's not to be, have your love received. It's just to be actually annihilated in a kind of a. The more we talk about it, it's like the more I remember just like how dark this stuff is. And yeah. I was thinking about this whole, it's all perfect perfection thing to a really frightening extreme where. And I hear it often where people will talk about like war or poverty and all these things. And the, mm. the response will really be like, once you see that everything's perfect, you'll no longer, you'll see the futility of even caring about that or stepping in for it. Yeah. And I also see a really big thing with, in terms of trauma is like using that whole, it's all perfect. And that type of love that we're talking about, like to mm to stay in unhealthy situations and and this is really spiritual bypassing at its extreme but Absolutely. i actually have heard a radical non-dual teacher and i doubt she's the only one that was actually speaking to a participant at her event who talked about having recently been like pushed around and she's are you even saying that when somebody pushes me physically that I should see it's all perfect. And she basically went on to explain to her how she could learn not only to see it as perfect, but to enjoy physical violence by harnessing that perspective. And so it's just, it does get taken to these kinds of extremes that I hope people will be able to see yeah. it at the time more so. I'll be able to at least switch on a bit of critical thoughts yeah. about that. Push you that you easily start to think, oh, there's something wrong with critical thought. That implies separation. Yeah, it had to do with if you stop so labeling, if you stop labeling physical violence as good or bad. This is what she said, or interpreting it as wanted or unwanted, yeah. then you can just enjoy it all as love or whatever. And obviously, there can be great value in being able to take these perspectives in a different scenario, but to not be able, and this is what I see in these scenes is like, there's no ability to like draw the line anywhere. Yeah. just well, one thing that, that, that strikes me and just what you said is how non-duality often positions itself as, I would say spirituality in general does this as non-religious got religion here, which is all about beliefs and orthodoxy and rituals. And then you've got spirituality, which is just free from all of that. But. When I, I was brought up a Catholic and I was said, like, if something bad happened to me or worse was done to me, I was told to offer it up. That's a gift to God to yeah. be like hurt or abused or, or whatever, or just in pain that, and it, it just seems to be another version of that. It's just twisted into a, as though it's something completely different, but it's exactly the same. If you're being told somebody just punched you in the face, trying to see it as loving or as love, at least. It's a way to, it is a way to like really avoid trauma or the source of trauma if you can just turn it into love, but you're, it's in a way, it's just toxic positivity <laughs> made into a spirituality oh, as well. Yeah. That's well, well, and if you come and, and say anything about that, then you're, then that's suddenly that's when the moralism kicks in, actually, suddenly you're the baddie for making a complaint, don't make a complaint. It's all good here. Everything's love. That's so right. There is, there is a hell of a load of moralism as well. Paradoxically, it's just, 
as long as it's pointed away from the guru, then it's fine. As long as if it's pointed to the guru, then that's, yeah, that's when I'm right. Totally. Amazing insight. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it comes with that whole idea that if I'm not experiencing peace and perfection while somebody is harming me, then you feel ashamed. It's my fault. Yeah, it's very victim. Blame blame. victim. Yeah. Breathe it out. Try that. Scary. But the religious thing is important too. Cause I think they're understandably like in some religions, the morality is rigid and unrealistic mm. and that can have, let's say moral dogma and stuff like that can, can be problematic, but I think people don't realize that they're replacing it with something that's equally as dogmatic, yeah. but it's hidden. You don't really notice it. You don't, so. yeah. Because the, in religion, at least in religion, it's presented as a creed or a doctrine or a holy scripture or something like that. So at least you, you have a little bit of distance where you can, whereas here, this is just truth. The word of truth, don't analyze the words, don't, don't employ critical kind of shrink it in or it's just, it's just, it's just, but yeah, I can see how similar they are because it's, you'll constantly be giving this kind of readily made answer. There's no room for you to think or feel or see like that's already been decided. That's yeah. and, and that's delivered yeah. by somebody else, whether it's a priest or a non-dual communicator is beside the point. There's no room for your insight, your perceptiveness, no room for you to breathe or yeah. Yeah. And there's such a, such an effect that so many people have of like feeling shame and guilt around, there's a lot of judgment in there, of course, right? Your ignorant ego mind that has to label abuse as bad or something, but that's a topic for another time. There's one more thing that you want to address. <laughs> oh yeah. Like I want to talk about memory because I'm just happy that that stuck out to you too. Cause one of the things that all you and I both experienced and have seen in other people very commonly from following these teachings and having the shifts that they lead to of that sort of that dissolution of or disengagement of reflective thinking and like that kind of discontinuity. You're disassociated from your memory like your especially when there's like the I don't know more erosion of like the narrative life narrative and like the narrative element of self and a big thing is there is no history there is no time whatever but that having memory gaps or memory issues or going blank a lot is really common and the natural result of it that I see is not a bug but a pretty common feature is memory issues. I was curious what your experience is with that. Many people that we've spoken to and, and worked with really suffer that. They just really lose it and they're in a slightly disconnected world and they can't really remember things. They can't really hear or listen or it. Yeah. And the, my thoughts about it, like I really, as after I left non to be a, I trained in a kind of fairly kind of normal talk psychotherapy. And then I got really drawn to body psychotherapy. And while I was training in that, I joined a, a neuroscience kind of research group that focused on embodied cognition, which is just like how our brains and I see our nervous system and our mind that are, are embodied things. They don't just float around nowhere. They, they, they're deeply connected with how we feel. And if you you don't look at the brain in isolation, but you see it as connected to the spinal column and then all of the, the millions, the millions of, of sense receptors and the, the afferent and efferents that the, what the one, basically there's a whole branch of sense receptors to do with gathering a feeling of yourself. That's how you can feel inside your body or your heart or your stomach or, and then across the surface of your skin, that's your senses. All of that is to do with generating a sense of yourself that is required for you to coordinate yourself, to distinguish between you and you, to be able to have a, a basic spatial relationship with anything around you, a sense of what's inside your body and outside your bodies. And it's core to sort of self-regulation, which kind of means your heart rate and your body temperature and 
digesting food and making you get sleepy and waking you up when you've had enough rest and all of that comes from and is very much connected to having a and a rich sense of yourself and that can be conscious or it can be unconscious there's so the word is interoception like perceiving the inside of your body and interoceptive awareness can be high or low you can have a very rich sense of your feeling of your internal sensory world or you can almost be oblivious to it the non-duality it, you're told you're not the body there's no inside and outside you're no one all of these things work against the body so if you're reading that you're hearing that it's going to be impairing that that kind of 3d sense of yourself that's a really healthy lovely thing to have and it does the opposite it takes you out of that suddenly there's no you there's no other there's no inside no outside and then from there it it makes complete sense that people have issues of the kind we've described not being like really being able to remember yesterday or and it's so common that i find people and I, i've had this as well having digestive issues having sleep issues it makes sense how can your body regulate itself if it, if its basic sense of itself is being constantly interrupted by this recoding of your experience into actually that's nothing actually it's it's just an appearance actually there's no body actually there's no you actually there's no inside outside no wonder it interferes with that. And, and, and when it comes in, they can't imagine it's anything to do with this wonderful spiritual thing that they're doing. Or they feel maybe it's just a phase. My body needs to adapt. You'll hear that a lot. You know, you, uh, um, body can only take so much. You have to gradually, um, but again, I think it's just that way of keeping non-duality pure and fine. And there's nothing wrong with it. It's the total so, embodiment. Stringless embodiment. Absolutely. Uh-huh. And so already derealization and depersonalization. And so realization is being, derealization is being branded as realization. Yes. I get back into Orwellian space. Well, I was just thinking like with the memory thing, I'm a total nerd about the stuff. So I was learning about the default mode network, like DMN and how it's. I love that. Okay. So it's like when you take psychedelics, for example, what gets actually inactivated to have these expanded experiences is the default mode network and that's the same network that is basically online when you're engaged in like reflective thought and critical thinking and stuff like that and naturally the dmn in no self spiritual circles it can be really looked down upon and glorified as diminish it deactivate it when i looked into it the default mode network is also responsible for memory, like memory retrieval yeah. and moral decision making and empathy. So it was really yeah. fascinating to see some of these like underlying, I don't know if it's like physiological or neurological explanations yeah. for why some of these unexpected, usually unwanted side effects happen when you seriously erode your reflective thought processes and embodiment as you're saying it's really interesting to hear about the the neurology of it and the the kind of neuroscience take of it and i, I definitely just from a more kind of phenomenal logical perspective i to me i think people often think of critical thought as something yeah like i don't know like a bit mean or or i don't know like being critical but critical right. thought doesn't mean that so i think that's a, that's a false kind of binary that people think of criticism as opposed to freedom and empathy and openness. I want to say about a conversation, I enjoyed it and, but, and it's good and useful, I, hopefully to people. Yeah. Let's just say, yeah, like I, I'm hoping that this conversation helps some people. It was wonderful talking to you, the really important topics. So I'm just grateful to be able to talk about them with someone who has such like deep insights from firsthand experience. I think that's rare to hear a perspective from somebody like yourself who was very much immersed in that kind of experiencing and teaching, if we're going to call it teaching, but now has come out of it and works with people who have been hurt by it. Thank you. I've really enjoyed the conversation and I 
really grateful for you to making sure this people hear this and hear a different perspective yeah. that from your perspective and my perspective is the reality of what's going on. Obviously we don't patronize any viewers here. It's up to people to make their own sense of things from what they, they see and hear. Yeah. I hope it, it reaches some people in a, in a helpful way. Yeah. Um, I ultimately hope is just that people will be like cautious mm. and discerning around going down these types of paths. Yeah. No. All right, Jess. Great to talk to you. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.